March 27, 1980, Southwestern Washington State, 6.02 a.m. The sun rises over the Cascades Range, a chain of volcanoes situated above the Pacific Fault Line. Towering over the landscape is the 9,677-foot Mount St. Helens. Known because of its beauty as the Mount Fuji of the United States, the volcano has been dormant for 123 years. Hundreds of campers, hikers, and photographers are converging on the mountain for the weekend. It's also a work day for over 300 forestry workers. Near Spirit Lake, less than five miles from the summit, U.S. Forest Service Supervisor Kathy Anderson and her tree planting crew hear what sounds like a small explosion. What was common around there, because of the private timberlands in that area, were road building and other activities. So we kind of assumed that that had been just stump blasting or something. But in fact, Mount St. Helens has awakened from its long slumber with a small eruption of steam and ash, opening a 250-foot-wide crater in the summit. Within minutes, word reaches the Menlo Park, California office of the U.S. Geological Survey, or USGS. On hand that afternoon is geologist Don Swanson. We quickly packed our bags and jumped on the first flight up to, uh, up to Portland. Despite the eruption, logging companies in the area keep working. The Warehouser Corporation grows and harvests trees for building materials and paper on over 68,000 acres of land on Mount St. Helens. The day after the initial eruption, the company dispatches helicopter pilot Jess Hagerman to fly over the volcano. Right on the very top, the whole top, there was a, a little bitty crater, and there were these big cracks running horizontal around the mountain. USGS scientists install more monitoring equipment at their main observation post, known as Cold Water One. The eruption has been a minor one, but they see it as a precursor of a larger and potentially deadly event. One of them, a 30-year-old volcanologist named David Johnston, voices his fears to a network news crew. It's probably heating up very quickly, and it was probably pretty good evidence that an eruption may be likely. The U.S. Forest Service puts up roadblocks closing the top of the mountain. Forty residents who live nearest the summit are evacuated. Underground tremors make the eruption of Mount St. Helens seem imminent. The governor of Washington declares a state of emergency. Because rapid evacuation might be necessary, tourists and sightseers are urged to stay out of the area. But the warnings have the opposite effect and tourists pour in from around the country. Souvenir vendors hawk t-shirts and bottles of genuine volcanic ash. Some volcano enthusiasts try to get as close to the summit as possible. One of them is Robert Rogers, a 29-year-old radio technician with a passion for mountain climbing. He makes a game out of outwitting the sheriff's department. I would drive up and go, oh, is it really dangerous up there? Oh, yes, son, it's very dangerous. Oh, do people try to sneak in? Yes, we, we saw a guy up there two mornings ago in a blue sleeping bag. Oh, really? Tell me, what did you do then? And they'd explain what they did to try to catch me. Because I was the guy in the blue sleeping bag. For geologists, however, watching the mountain is no sport. You just didn't have time to do anything but, but eat and sleep and uh, work. Clear weather brings out a record-breaking number of tourists and television crews. News choppers airlift reporters to the summit, ignoring the danger warnings. They are rewarded with 18 small bursts of steam and ash throughout the day. Four weeks after the initial eruption, scientists discover an alarming bulge on the north side of the mountain. Magma, rising within Mount St. Helens, has encountered a blockage in the mouth of the volcano and is being forced out around it. Scientists, like volcano hazard specialist Dan Miller, explain the danger to emergency agencies, but little is done. As the weeks passed and nothing serious happened at Mount St. Helens, it became more and more difficult for us to convince um, the various agencies, both state, federal, and local, that something ugly was about to happen. Over the next two weeks, the bulge on the north side of Mount St. Helens grows larger every day. 
the mountain was moving at such a rapid rate, about five feet a day or so horizontally, just day after day after day after day. Officials finally heed the scientists' warnings and establish a so-called red zone, a safety perimeter that extends from three to eight miles around the summit. They begin evacuating residents. On the banks of Spirit Lake, less than five miles from the summit, an 84-year-old resident named Harry R. Truman, no relation to Harry S. Truman, tells reporters he has no plans to leave. That's my life. Spirit Lake and Mount St. Held is my life, folks. I've lived there 50 years. It's a part of me. That mountain and that lake is a part of Truman, and I'm a part of it. Truman's defiance of authority makes him a folk hero overnight. May 1st, 1980. A month has passed since the first eruption. Without another major event, public excitement dies down. But the ominous bulge on the mountain continues to grow. The U.S. Geological Survey sets up a new observation post, Cold Water 2, five miles northeast of the summit. This one is three miles closer to the volcano than the existing site at Cold Water 1. At Cold Water 1, Roe Finley, an assistant editor with National Geographic magazine, is interviewing 27-year-old photographer Reed Blackburn when the ground begins to tremble. I looked at Reed without saying anything, but with concern, and he said, earthquake, uh, I think it's about a 4.5. The earthquake is just one of many that occur each day on the volcano, but any one of them could trigger an eruption. Blackburn, on assignment with the Vancouver Columbia newspaper, is ready if the mountain erupts. He is positioned where he can trigger two remote control cameras placed one mile from the summit. A graduate student manning cold water two must leave for the weekend. Geologist Don Swanson and his colleague David Johnston agree to take turns filling in for him. Dave said, okay, I'll do it for, for Saturday night if you can come up on Sunday and, uh, and replace me. May 17th, 1980, 8 a.m. It's been more than a month and a half since the first eruption. Despite the fears of USGS scientists, many of the residents evacuated from the red zone are convinced that the crisis has passed. They gather at the roadblock nearest Spirit Lake. Tempers flare as they try to return to their homes. We're paying taxes and we would, we'd like to use our property. I'm not afraid. Governor Dixie Lee Ray relents and gives them permission to visit their homes today and again on Sunday. Everyone had to sign waivers, releasing the county from any blame for what might happen to them while they were inside the red zone checking out their property. The beautiful day brings a number of campers out into the Washington woods. At Jericho Hole on the Tootle River, 25 miles west of Mount St. Helens, high school sweethearts Venus Durgan and Roald Reeton park their car by a favorite fishing spot. There were no other people around us at all, so we just listened to the radio and sat up. Roald has hidden a bottle of champagne deep in their cooler, a surprise treat for Sunday night. Six miles west of the summit, Ty Kearney, a ham radio operator, volunteering to monitor the mountain for the state of Washington, receives a transmission from a fellow volunteer, Jerry Martin of Concrete, Washington. Martin has stationed his radio van at a perfect viewpoint, just seven miles away from the bulging north side of the mountain. Backpacking with his wife, Lou, and their two young daughters, three-month-old Tara and four-year-old Bonnie, Mike Moore passes up two campsites. This was Bonnie's first backpacking trip. We wanted it to be something memorable for her. They find an ideal spot near the Green River, 13 miles north of Mount St. Helens. In Bear Meadows, 14 miles northeast of the summit, amateur photographer Gary Rosenquist and a group of friends set up camp after dark. We made a real big fire because of all the wood that was around there and just had a good time uh, telling stories. It was just a beautiful night. May 18th, 1980, Swift Creek, 5.30 a.m. Tree planting crew chief Kathy Anderson informs her crew they will abandon their site near Clearwater Creek and relocate to Swift Creek, six miles south of the summit. I'm still not certain what caused me to have that thought. It was out of the norm for us to, to stop working in one area and go to another when we weren't finished. One member of her crew, Cran Kilpatrick, is surprised by her decision. 
we were actually going to some place much closer to the mountain than where we were on Saturday and uh, potentially a lot more danger. As the sun rises over Mount St. Helens, Jim Skamanke and a three-man thinning crew begin cutting saplings 13 miles from the summit. 100 miles away, at the airport in Yakima, Washington, a Cessna 182 takes off on a reconnaissance flight over the volcano. On board is geologist Dorothy Stoffel. It was my first time to fly in a small plane, and I, I was a little anxious about it, kind of unsettled, and really not knowing what to expect. At the USGS office in Vancouver, 40 miles from Mount St. Helens summit, geologist Don Swanson is waiting for colleagues to arrive. People were going to bring me supplies that I could take up to uh, live from when I, when I was up at Coldwater too. Volcano hazard specialist Dan Miller starts out on the two-hour drive to Coldwater 2. He's bringing supplies and parts for the two time-lapse cameras. I drove over to the battery shed and picked up all of the batteries that I had had on the charger overnight. Nearly eight miles west of the summit, Robert Rogers and his friend Francisco Valenzuela arrive at the Sheep Creek Overlook. They have just finished another illegal climb. They park near ham radio operator Ty Kearney. He looks up and says, well, where were you boys this morning? We made up some story of driving around. We didn't want to tell him we'd gone into the red zone. 8.30 AM. Just above the summit, geologist Dorothy Stoffel is taking photos of the volcano. We were flying directly over the south crater wall about 500 feet. And as we went over the mountain, I took pictures of Harry Truman's lodge. Lou Moore is making breakfast at her family's Green River campsite. Tara had been brought out of the tent and sat next to uh, where Lou was working. Bonnie was wandering around. I was wandering around. I was hanging out down in the uh, room with the seismographs. We dropped John off at his unit and his crew, and they uh, started to plant their trees. I was heading up um, Interstate 5. We made a decision we'll make one last pass. One mile beneath Mount St. Helens, an earthquake measuring 5.1 on the Richter scale shakes the mountain, setting in motion a terrifying chain reaction. Mount St. Helens erupts with an explosive fury, next on Minute by Minute. And now back to Minute by Minute. May 18th, 1980, Mount St. Helens, Washington, 8.32 a.m. An earthquake measuring 5.1 on the Richter scale rips through the core of Mount St. Helens. We began to see this enormous fracture open up. It was as though you were slicing the mountain in half. The whole north side of the mountain began to shake. Seconds later, like a zipper from east to west, these little brown detonations, poof, 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 zipped right across the top of the mountain. Suddenly, I just looked up, heard some sound, and looked up, and here was this tremendous signal. The ground moved a little bit, and then, oh my god, <laughs> the whole mountain took off. Twenty-five seconds after the earthquake hits, a huge explosion bursts out from the north face of Mount St. Helens. Superheated gas shoots rock and ash more than 12 miles into the air. Dorothy Stoffel's plane is dodging deadly jets of hot gas and ash. Her pilot thinks fast. He's diving the plane to try to gain speed, to outrun the blast, and watching the ground coming up from below and thinking he's going to nose this plane right into the ground. On a ridge less than eight miles from the explosion, Robert Rogers runs to grab his camera. I get back to the car, whip open the door, drop a roll of unexposed film, and start shooting really fast. Click, 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 jam. I got six shots, and my camera jammed. In Bear Meadows, 14 miles to the northeast, amateur photographer Gary Rosenquist grabs his camera and snaps 23 photos in just 30 seconds. I couldn't concentrate on a viewfinder, so I started taking photographs again, and I just kept fit, taking photographs till the, I ran out of film. David Johnston, who is at observation base Coldwater 2, less than six miles from the blast, radios in to the USGS office in Vancouver, Washington. 
He gets out one short statement, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it, before the radio goes dead. All the while, ham radio operator Jerry Martin is broadcasting from a ridge two miles farther north. Now we got a big slide coming off the west slope. So, uh, now we got a whole big, big uh, eruption out of the uh, crater. And we got another that opened up on the west side. Martin watches in horror as the USGS observation post at Coldwater 2 is swept up in the enormous slide. The whole northwest Jerry Martin signs off. He has never heard from again. 8.33 a.m. Two more huge blasts of gas and rock shoot out as the northwest side of the mountain crumbles. The eruption covers a 230 square mile area and dumps 200 feet of rubble into Spirit Lake and onto Harry R. Truman, killing him. Above the mountain, Dorothy Stoffel's plane banks south and pulls away from the blast. Dorothy looks back to see the top of the mountain torn open by a force 500 times greater than the atomic bomb at Hiroshima. We saw this huge blast cloud lift up. And as it lifted up, there was lightning, tremendous lightning bolts going tens of thousands of feet high. At the Cold Water One camp, eight miles from the summit, Photographer Reed Blackburn jumps into his car and guns it, desperately trying to outrun the cloud of ash. It's too late. In seconds, his car is engulfed. Blackburn is suffocated in four feet of scalding ash. The wind is so powerful that it uproots 100-foot trees as far as 19 miles away. Eight miles from the summit, Francisco Valenzuelo and Robert Rogers jump into their vehicles and screech away. Our clothing was like in a gale, just blowing. It was like a, a freight train with 10,000 square wheels just going by. It was the loudest noise I'd ever heard. Six miles south of the summit near Swift Creek, Cran Kilpatrick's Forest Service crew is running for their lives. Kilpatrick and Kathy Anderson are waiting in their truck at the top of the ridge, ready to lead the evacuation. They can only hope to get their team out before the cloud of burning ash and steam envelops them. You could see these things periodically shoot down the south slope. They were coming straight at us. If we had been a half a mile closer, we would have been torched. What Kilpatrick and his colleagues don't yet realize is that if they had stuck with their original plans to work on the north side of the mountain, they would all be dead. Still, the crew is far from safe. Laden with tools, they are slow to climb the steep slope to their vehicles. Kathy calls on her radio, dump all the equipment, let's get out of here. Minutes later, everyone reaches their trucks and drives to a rendezvous site where they wait for word on the safe evacuation route from a spotter plane. You could just see the debris going overhead, and we had lightning around us. USGS geologist Dan Miller is on Interstate 5, 15 miles southwest of the mountain. He's on his way to meet David Johnston at Coldwater 2 when he sees the eruption column. I realized immediately that this was really a huge and very serious eruption. I quickly crossed over the median on Interstate 5 and I went racing back into Vancouver. 13 miles north of the summit, Mike and Lou Moore and their daughters, three-month-old Tara and four-year-old Bonnie, look up to see a tremendous cloud towering over the trees. Mike grabs his camera. The more pictures I took, the more apprehensive I got because the blast was not going up. It was coming toward us like it was being shot out of a shotgun. The ash, hot enough to burn skin on contact, is surging down the mountain at a rate of up to 300 miles an hour. 11 miles southwest of the summit, Robert Rogers is in his car following Ty Kearney's van down a winding mountain road. The group is trying to outrun the cloud, but in the ever-thickening haze, Rogers loses sight of the van. Kearney goes on to safety, but Rogers and Valenzuela are stuck in the swirling ash. The second time we passed this gigantic caterpillar tractor in the dark, <laughs> we knew we were lost. High above them, Dorothy Stoffel is in a small airplane, hoping to put some distance between herself and the mountain. We began to see this huge grouping of aircraft 
rushing towards the mountain and we thought, you know, just like the media, <laughs> you know, they're going to get there as fast as they can while we're trying to leave. Stoffel lands 40 miles away in Portland. 13 miles north of the summit, the Moore family is hit by a shock wave. We felt a squeezing of our bodies, a very tight squeezing. And Lou said that this didn't happen to her, but my ears popped repeatedly, just pop, 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 pop. 40 miles away in Vancouver, the phone rings in National Geographic editor Roe Finley's hotel room. It was Ralph Perry, one of our contract photographers. He said, Roe, if you'll step out the door of your motel and look to the northeast, you can see Mount St. Helens filling the sky. At his home in Kelso, Washington, Ray Pleasant, a helicopter base manager for the Warehouse Corporation, is still in bed when he hears a knock at the door. Our neighbor, she used to monitor the CV or the uh, a scanner, and she found out that the mountain had erupted. Although his logging crews are outside the red zone, Pleasant needs every available chopper in the air for possible rescues. He immediately heads out to the nearest base. On a small farm 37 miles from the summit, Jess Hagerman, a captain in the National Guard, is getting ready for church. They called me to, to call and find out how many people we had that were uh, able to fly. Hagerman immediately heads to the Air National Guard base at Fort Lewis, 20 miles away. The vertical column of ash and steam continues to expand upward and outward. 13 miles away at the Green River campsite, ash begins to rain onto the Moore family. They take cover in a dilapidated hunter's shack, but it affords little protection. Mike and Lou Moore's primary concern, keeping their daughters alive. We gave Bonnie a handkerchief that had been wetted down with water from a canteen. Well, it wasn't going to work for Tara. She's three months old. So what we did is we wrapped her up in blankets. At one point, Lou went over and pinched her because she was so quiet, she thought she was dead, and she wanted her to cry <laughs> to prove that she wasn't dead. <laughs> and we were all very relieved to hear that cry. The intense heat from the volcano melts the mountain's ice cap, sending 46 billion gallons of water into the Toodle Valley below. Mudslides, heated to 91 degrees and moving at 90 miles per hour, rush down the mountain. 25 miles from the summit, along the south fork of the Toodle River, high school sweethearts Roald Reeton and Venus Durgan hear the sound of warning sirens. We just pulled the tent right out of the stakes right the and ran up to the car. Roald guns the engine of his Oldsmobile, but it's too late. The engorged Toodle River is now raging toward them, carrying logs and debris from nearby lumber yards. We surrounded the car and picked up the car, and at that point, the first instinct was to get out of the car, but there was no place to run. <laughs> The car is engulfed by the flood. They jump from the vehicle into the swirling mass. I was lucky enough to land on a large log. And Venus went right in between the one I landed on and another one and was gone, just instantly gone. It's like, I, I thought she was dead. The couple and hundreds of others on the mountain fight to survive, next on a &E. And now back to Minute by Minute. May 18th, 1980, Mount St. Helens, Washington. 9.01 a.m. Mount St. Helens has erupted with the force of 10 megatons of TNT. A cloud of scorching ash mushrooms 15 miles into the air. 25 miles away, along the south fork of the Toodle River, campers Roald Reeton and Venus Durgan have been swept away by a deluge of mud and logs. Venus loses sight of Roald as she is sucked down into the morass. I could hear him screaming in terror. I kept my hands and head above water, and at one point, two logs started pinching my wrist. I thought I was going to lose my arm or my hand. The pain was excruciating, and at that point, I thought it was over. 
Rold, clinging desperately to a log, sees Venus's hand reaching out between two massive timbers. He lunges for her as the logs close in around her. They were moving up and down and sideways, and it would just like peel the skin off her chin. I felt him pull me up on top of a log, and he just kept screaming to hang on. Finally, after a terrifying mile-long ride, Rold maneuvers Venus across the logs and onto the banks of the river. Venus's wrist is smashed, and her right forearm is stripped down to the muscle. She is going into shock, and Rold knows that their only chance of survival is to keep moving. They make their way through the thick forest, hoping to find a way out. Walking back through that was, was hell. I heard a number of helicopters overhead, so at that point I wanted to get out of that heavy stand of trees we were at and be found. Nine miles from the summit, tree planters Cran Kilpatrick and Kathy Anderson have been waiting for 30 minutes with a convoy of Forest Service trucks. They're hoping a spotter plane will arrive soon to scout a safe route off the mountain. They are in constant danger of being engulfed by burning ash. As the crew waits, tension builds to the breaking point. There's one guy who started to run, and we actually literally had to grab him and throw him back into the van. He got hit, <laughs> mostly to just gonna knock some sense back into him. Finally, word comes over the radio that the ash is still too thick to allow a spotter plane to fly into their area. They'll have to find their own way out, driving across the bridge of the already swollen Swift Creek. I ran out onto the bridge. What I wanted to do is see if a mud flow was coming down the uh, Swift Creek. There wasn't one coming, so I signaled everybody across the bridge. Ash is raining down heavily as Kilpatrick jumps into the last vehicle on the convoy. Just on the other side of the bridge, his truck stalls. This truck in front of us just disappears into the cloud. We didn't see anybody. It was like, oh my God, we're alone here. Kilpatrick radios Anderson, and she hurries back to pick him up. The convoy slowly makes its way down the mountain to safety. Two miles from the summit, geologist Don Swanson is flying in a Forest Service plane, searching for his colleague, David Johnston. There was not much chance that David or anybody else in the area was, was going to live through it. Heading toward the mountain in a Cessna, Roe Finley hopes to reach photographer Reed Blackburn at Coldwater One. And I'd flown over uh, cities bombed and burning during the war, but this was so much more awesome. The wind shifts, and the ash cloud heads east, a welcome sight to the Moore family, who are hiding out in an old shack 13 miles to the north of the volcano. I decided it was time to go out and, and see what I could see outside. Unfortunately, the door was blocked with six inches of ash, and it took quite a bit of kicking to, to get it open. I could make out the outline of a tree, and that's when I started feeling pretty good. Lou Moore carries three-month-old Tara, while Mike Moore gathers up four-year-old Bonnie. He shoulders the backpack containing their tent, food, and survival equipment. On a logging road eight miles from the summit, Robert Rogers and Francisco Valenzuela are lost in the haze of ash. Then, way behind us out on the west, was this little pinpoint of light. That little spot of light got bigger and bigger and bigger. As the air slowly clears, Rogers and Valenzuela are able to navigate their way out. The ash cloud reaches Yakima, Washington, 97 miles to the northeast. Though no longer hot, the ash makes it difficult to breathe. This is, of course, the source of the big problem, the volcanic ash buildup. I'd say the, um, the buildup now is at least three quarters of an inch. Residents must shovel off their roofs to keep them from collapsing. A weather satellite captures photos of the ash cloud as it stretches across Washington state and reaches Spokane, 200 miles to the northeast of Mount St. Helens. It has taken nearly three hours for badly injured campers Roald Reeton and Venus Durgan to struggle through the dense forest. I knew we had to go upstream because we floated underneath the bridge. I figured if anybody was going to be anywhere, they'd be there. And um, there was a sheriff's car on that bridge. The sheriff's deputy radios for a helicopter evacuation. Nearly four hours after the first explosion, the eruption is still going strong. 
fresh magma was rising up and was escaping from the volcano. Jets of burning gas sweep down the flanks of Mount St. Helens at up to 80 miles an hour. 11 miles from the summit, Mike Moore and his wife Lou try to get their young daughters to safety. Weighed down with survival equipment, Mike comes to an area of blown down trees 6 to 12 feet in diameter. I couldn't carry Bonnie. Lou couldn't carry her because she had Tara in her backpack, and Bonnie was basically on her own in between us. She's a pretty tough kid, but for four years old, you're asking an awful lot. The Moors struggle to keep their children alive as rescuers search frantically for stranded victims. Next, on Minute by Minute. Now back to Minute by Minute. May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens, Washington, 12 p.m. The mountain has now been erupting for three and a half hours, sending a total of 490 tons of ash hurtling over an area nearly the size of West Virginia. Emergency services estimate at least three people are missing and seven are confirmed dead. Area hospitals fill with injured, suffering from ash inhalation and burns. Rescue teams searching for survivors find they can't recognize a single landmark. Where's Spirit Lake? Is that it over there? I can't believe it's camped up in this area. The rescue operation is a dangerous one. The crews are getting tired. The machinery needs to be carefully maintained. Chopper pilot Ray Pleasant and his crew respond to an emergency call near the Toodle River. When they arrive, they find Roald Reeton and his badly injured girlfriend, Venus Durgan. The crew jumps out and loads Venus in. Pilot Ray Pleasant pulls back on the controls and heads out of danger. I was able to look back. I just saw this brown body, a tiny little brown body in the back with the big, big eyes looking at me and uh, just scared. A second helicopter airlifts Reeton out. The choppers fly across the river to the town of Tootle, where a medevac unit has been set up at a school. 14 miles from the summit, the ash is so thick it is almost impossible to see the ground. National Guard chopper pilot Jess Hagerman flies his OH-58 back and forth over the terrain, searching for Jim Skamanke and his forestry crew. All of a sudden, we look down and we see some kind of a car or a, a truck down there. And, and so we swung around. One thing that you could see were footprints in, in the ash. So then you know that you've probably got some survivors. The footprints diverge, indicating the four men split into two parties. Hagerman banks his copter and follows one set until he locates two of the missing men. One of the people would stand up and, and wave his arms, and then, you know, he'd kind of fall back down, and, and the other fellow never really did get up off the ground. Hagerman's crew chief, Randy Fonts, volunteers to go down after the two men, even though he has no idea what awaits him. This stuff could have been uh, 150 degrees Fahrenheit. We hadn't, didn't have a clue. But so anyway, he gets out of the helicopter, gets on the skid, and jumps into this stuff. The ash has cooled considerably, but it was scalding when it blasted over the stranded men. One of the foresters, Jim Skamanke, is burned over nearly half his body. His co-worker is sprawled on the ground near him, barely able to breathe. Hagerman lands the helicopter and hurries through eight inches of talcum powder fine ash to help his crew chief evacuate the badly burned men. When you touch their clothes, it was, it was like if you scorch your clothes with an iron and you just pull it like that and it, it just shreds apart. The two men are taken to nearby Longview Hospital where they are treated for second and third degree burns and ash inhalation. An Air National Guard helicopter finds the third member of the crew sitting atop a tree in the middle of a mud flow. He is rushed to the hospital. But the leader of the crew is still missing. Venus Durgan is at Longview Hospital receiving medical attention. Her wounds are filled with ash. The nurses were crying because they had to immerse me in a tub of water and take sponges and scrape out my wounds and when the doctor came in he said 
He didn't do a good enough job. I, they had to take me back in a second time, and they had to put me on morphine at that point because I was in such pain. Robert Rogers makes it out of the woods and stops on the I-5 freeway to look back at the volcano 25 miles away. Everybody was stopped on the freeway looking at the volcano saying, look at him, he's covered with ash. And I drove back to Portland and that was, that was it. Now that the pressure within the volcano is relieved, the eruption gradually begins to subside. 200 square miles of forest have been destroyed. Heavy equipment lays tossed about like toys. Nine and a half hours after the eruption, Venus Durgan's boyfriend, Roald Reedon, is released from Longview Hospital into his parents' care. They find a hotel for the night, and Roald's father tries to scrub more ash from his son's wounds. Oh, it hurt so bad. It was like I, I passed out. I mean, God bless him. You know, he, he, he did a pretty good job, but, you know, it, he didn't get it all out. So, you know, I'm tattooed in spots on my legs, you know, from where the ash got rubbed into my skin. In her hospital room, Venus Durgan watches coverage of the eruption. I laid in the hospital room that night, watching all the events on TV. My IV bottle in the hospital is shaking every time the mountain erupts. But not everyone is out of danger. As night falls on Mount St. Helens, Mike Moore, his wife, and two young daughters have not been able to find their way out of the forest. They pitch camp for the night, but Mike cannot sleep. We could hear the volcano exploding and crackling, kind of like a witch's cauldron. They will have to wait for sunrise and hope for rescue. That's next on a and &E. Where were you when Mount St. Helens erupted? Tell us at a and .com. And now back to Minute by Minute. May 19, 1980, 5.55 a.m. On the morning after the eruption of Mount St. Helens, National Guard helicopter pilot Jess Hagerman takes to the sky to continue the rescue effort. I really didn't have a clue where I was. You couldn't see more than an eighth of a mile, uh, sometimes less. When the ash does part, it reveals fallen trees stretching as far as the eye can see. Despite the devastation, rescuers still hope to find survivors. But as time goes by, they find themselves placing more and more red flags to mark the dead. One family on the mountain has survived the eruption. Mike Moore, his wife Lou, and their two children have spent 26 hours in the forest near Mount St. Helens, unable to make their way to safety. Suddenly, here comes a helicopter flying in our direction. There's the 304 squadron out of Portland. They put two paramedics on the ground. The Air Force team tries to airlift the family out. Every time the cable came down, the helicopter kicked up so much ash, nobody could see the cable. A cable rescue is impossible. The chopper will have to find a place to touch down. The Moore family and the paramedics hike to the Green River, but find no room for a landing there either. At that moment, Air National Guard chopper pilot Jess Hagerman flies over. He radios the rescue team and offers to use his smaller craft to evacuate the moors. There was no place to set the helicopter all the way down, so I had to kind of hold it on one skid. The moors, who have their three-month-old daughter Tara in their backpack, climb into the helicopter. They start sticking this great big huge Kelty backpack. I said, we don't have room for that. He said, well, there's a baby in there. I said, well, stuff her aboard. Hagerman takes off and brings the Moore family to nearby Longview Hospital, where they are treated for minor scratches and sent home. Hundreds of volunteers rescue more than 150 people in just 36 hours, but three are still missing and eight are confirmed dead. 31 hours after the eruption, Venus Durgan is released from the hospital. She faces two years of physical therapy to regain the use of her flayed arm. Two days after the eruption, a group of geologists lands near the observation base Coldwater One. There, they find photographer Reed Blackburn's car. We kneeled down to look inside the car, and, and there was Reed. His hair was burned and so forth, looking in the car. Yeah. It was pretty gruesome. 
Three days after the eruption, President Jimmy Carter flies over the area, surveying the destruction. Federal emergency relief is on its way for the four counties hardest hit by the blast. The absolute and total devastation of a region that encompasses about 150 miles, it's the worst thing I have ever seen. The force of the eruption has spewed measurable amounts of ash as far east as Minnesota and as far south as Oklahoma. May 25, 1980. One week after the big blast, the mountain erupts again, sending a column of ash eight miles high. Compared to the May 18th eruption, it's a minor event and does minimal damage. The death toll now stands at 21, and 72 people are missing. 230 square miles have been devastated, roadways have been swept away, and railroads buried. 68,000 acres of commercial timber worth $400 million have been damaged or destroyed. Forester Jim Skamanke is in Emanuel Hospital Burn Center in Portland, Oregon, where he endures four skin graft operations for the burns that covered nearly half his body. He is the only survivor of his four-man crew. Along the devastated Toodle River, Rold Wheaton's brother locates the buried car and retrieves Rold's things from the trunk. So he brings in all this stuff, and then he pulls out and shows his Rolls parents, hey, look what I found in the back of Rolls' car, this big bottle of champagne. We're both underage, and Rolls' parents just look at Rolls and I, and we just kinda, I just kind of oh, sat there and slithered in my seat. We laughed. The champagne it was the best I ever tasted in my life. It was like double sweet, you know, because we lived through that, and that, that bottle lived through it. No more survivors are found, and bodies are recovered for months after the blast. There is no trace of 30-year-old geologist David Johnston, who was last heard from at the Cold Water II observation site. The body of the last member of Jim Skamanke's forestry crew was finally found in the branches of a tree, about two feet above a high water mark made by the Toodle River, dead from ash inhalation. In the end, the death toll will reach 57. Less than a year after the eruption, the first tree is planted in the blast zone. Five million more are planted over the next three years. The Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument is established, and tourism increases dramatically, boosting the area's economy. Thousands flock to the mountain, and a new Spirit Lake Highway is built to carry visitors to the spot where Coldwater II once stood. 20 years after the disaster, the National Forest Service organizes a reunion for rescuers and survivors. For those who attend, it is a time to remember and reflect. I was one of the lucky ones, and through that luck of not going back to where we were on Saturday, I'm here today. I don't take life for granted, nor do I take our children for granted. Um, it's not lost on me. Uh, what a gift it is to have them. Venus Durgan and Roald Reeton have remained friends. The eruption forged a bond that has stood the test of time. The ultimate act of love and friendship that anybody can do is risk their life to save yours. And I don't think you're going to ask for anyone to do anything more for you. And for that, you know, I'll always be grateful to Roald. You know, I'll, I'll always be a place in my heart. The May 18th, 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens remains the most devastating volcanic event in the history of the continental United States. Some of its impact has been positive. The U.S. Geological Survey used the data from the eruption to create technological advances, including a satellite warning system for possible eruptions. Their work has saved thousands and honors the 57 men, women, and children who lost their lives at Mount St. Helens. When you see an erupting volcano, the power and the impact, the energy that's being released is truly stunning. And it makes you realize that we are pretty <laughs> insignificant creatures next to an erupting volcano.